Welcome to uh, the Foresight um, weekly online salons. It's now the second iteration of the salons that are focusing on um, artificial superintelligence coordination and strategy, uh, which is um, uh, a book now that uh, Romani and Polsky and I have co-edited. Uh, but really the salons are based on the chapters that have been submitted to this book uh, and that have been submitted by a variety of really incredible people. Um, and we're hoping that uh, by kind of like having them uh, talk, uh, talk you through the chapter uh, a little bit, we can at least entice you uh, to, to dive deeper. Um, we are like last week gonna have two constraints in place. Constraint number one is that um, we are going to try to uh, advance toward the topic of coordination from two very different angles um, and uh, and then going to try to have a discussion uh, about the different angles uh, after the two presentations uh, and then the second thing that we're going to accept is that we won't be covering everything that there is to discover in coordination and strategy in this one hour this is really just kind of like a window into that field um, and we're also going to accept that not even from the chapters that are going to be presented uh, we, we get a very, very good understanding, but this is just really to entice you to actually go out and read the chapters afterwards. Um, all right. And so I'm really happy with that. With those two constraints in place, I'm really happy to uh, introduce to you uh, the two presenters of today. We have Kristen uh, Carlson from the Department of Neurosurgery at the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center and the Harvard Medical School. And he will be presenting on safe artificial general intelligence via distributed ledger technology. And then he will be followed by Zimkit Sisha, who's an independent researcher from Hamburg, where I'm also from on uh, towards AI welfare science and policy. Um, so those are the two chapters that uh, are gonna be presented today. I'm super excited um, also for the discussion that we're gonna have um, after the presentations. I do think that uh, there's a ton of um, a ton of ways in which those papers in really interesting ways can inform each other. Um, and so I'm, I'm really looking forward to exploring uh, to exploring different ways there. I think, uh, you know, we may open up some uh, really interesting uh, boxes of Pandora's about uh, ethics. Um, but for now, I'm um, terribly excited to introduce to you um, and Kristen first, who's going to start off with uh, his presentation on safe artificial general intelligence via distributed ledger technology. And Kristen, I can't tell you how excited I am to have you. Um, just because, uh, if only for the fact that I'm currently co-authoring a book on intelligent voluntary cooperation, which draws very closely on many of the um, many of the principles that you discuss in your paper. Um, uh, but I have to say that you go into much, much more detail in how we can uh, actually create an ecosystem in which different agents, whether they're humans or artificial agents, can actually cooperate with each other uh, without having to know too much about their mind architectures. But how can we put uh, different uh, contracts or smart contracts in place that actually allow only voluntary co um, cooperative interactions to happen uh, amongst those uh, amongst those entities, um, and, uh, in a way where um, uh, we create a, uh, an ecosystem that is cooperative in the future, um, uh, independent of how strong those artificial agents uh, may be getting. So I'm really happy to kind of like have this quite alternative approach to, uh, I guess the at this point more straw man of like a a singleton approach uh, to be presented to you by, uh, by, by you today. And um, yeah, please take it away uh, before we move on to uh, Zoom and the discussion. Welcome. Well, very interesting uh, introduction. I appreciate it. And I thank the Foresight uh, Institute for the invitation to present. And I certainly look forward to um, reading your work now that you've told me a little bit about it. Um, so, you know, going back uh, to the 1980s, I was uh, chairing a seminar on natural and artificial computation. We read a whole ton of machine learning papers and AI papers, and I was not concerned at that time with um, uh, AI, uh, artificial general intelligence or super intelligence taking off in the near future. And uh, that lasted until the early 90s, and I peeked in on the field now and then, um, not in depth. But, uh, you know, a couple summers ago, I, I uh, started looking at the more recent developments, especially applications of deep learning, deep learning, and I did get concerned. Um, so what I realized then is uh, that I've been thinking about for quite a while is that at some point we'll be facing AI takeoff. Uh, not sure whether Nick Bostrom or someone originated that term, but um, essentially be when AI evolves too fast for human intervention. And at that point, uh, you know, what do we do? Um, how do we prepare for that? So at the same time, I was 
looking at cryptocurrency and distributed ledger technology. And basically the idea occurred to me that uh, we could use um, some of the distributed le ledger technology uh, to um, create automatic, automatic interventions. So when AI is evolving too fast for human intervention, we could have automatic responses. And um, due to the nature of uh, distributed ledger, ledger technology, DLT, uh, it would be unhackable or approach unhackability. Um, and then, uh, as you mentioned, um, you know, we're all striving to figure out what is a complete solution, you know, a set of necessary and sufficient components that would comprise a uh, system that would be aligned with human values uh, sufficiently to ensure our safety and better still, um, you know, where part of the machine's goals would be to um, um, bring us uh, greater resources that we desire, let's say. Um, so uh, several people, Bostrom and Yam Yampolsky and Turchin, uh, did a tremendous job, especially Yampolsky and Turchin, of um, enumerating the ways AGI could become dangerous to humanity. And from that, I think we can um, just briefly sketch a method that would be used to generate the axioms. This might be a bit obvious, so I'm not going to spend any time on it. But basically, uh, if you look at what Roman Yampolsky did or Turchin, they've got categories of pathways to dangerous AGI. And you can march down you know, each of those uh, categories, each example of a pathway, try to come up with a solution. And in the end, you've got a solution set. And um, I'm going to call those axioms. And the way I mean that is in the sense of von Neumann or Alan Newell, uh, who looked at things in a systems level uh, perspective. And they consider that an axiom, they define an axiom as encapsulating the salient aspects of some underlying systems level component that at the underlying systems level, it's worked out in much more detail. Um, so in that sense, uh, you could regard what I call axioms as um, software pro programs. They would be worked out at the underlying software level, but at a, at a higher systems level, uh, they're components of the solution. And as Marvin Minsky said, um, the way I look at this is we need, first thing we need to do is get the concepts right. So um, that might be non-mathematical. Uh, my paper got a little bit of criticism from early reviewers that it, there wasn't uh, enough technical content. Uh, later, later reviewers um, gave it much more favorable reviews. Um, so one thing we need to do, obviously, is uh, have a set of metrics that tell us how far we are from AGI takeoff. Um, you know, as I mentioned, the deep learning uh, has opened up brand new possibilities that were not um, happening in the in the uh, you know several decades ago. Uh, just to name a few, uh, machines beating at humans at chess and go. So these are immensely complicated games. Uh, Ten to the hundred and twentieth. Ten to the 340th, uh, 40th, uh, you know, possible routes. Uh, Jeopardy, AI with robust natural language processing, common sense. Poker, it's a game of incomplete information, as opposed to you can see the entire board and look at where to go. Dota 2, cooperating AIs, beating expert humans in war games. And what do we need to watch for? You know, you could say exponential growth of the metrics. Uh, or you could say super exponential growth. And what that implies is a positive feedback loop. And I think, um, say, AI self-programming, uh, that would be a watershed event. Uh, and that's why I think it might possibly be not that far off um, to uh, AGI takeoff. All right, we'll run through the axioms. Um, I'm going to assume basic familiarity with DLT, distributed ledger technology, the blockchain. Uh, you can store anything in a digital format. Um, the information is encrypted uh, with a very hard to hack coding of an audit chain. Multiple copies are stored in disparate locations uh, in a distributed ledger. And um, so there's no central point of failure. Consensus of stakeholders is required to approve and store any ledger entry. And there are a number of add-on technologies such as uh, so-called smart contracts, which was actually invented pre-blockchain. Um, which means automated automated uh, contract. Um, so the first axiom I would say is we need contractual distribution of intellectual property. Um, some information may be free. 
Um, most important information, I think, will have to be available under smart contracts. Uh, well, we have a comparison. Can anyone arm a nuclear bomb? Can anyone launch a nuclear tip missile? Or, or are these available only via a very strict, carefully controlled, you know, prescribed, proscribed contract? And AGI is more powerful than nuclear bombs or missiles and have control over those and much more. So smart contracts um, are a necessity for accessing the critical components of AGI. As Allison mentioned, um, you know, the subject of ethics is uh, very critical. How do we align our ethics or the best of human ethics, as Asilomar puts it, and uh, AI ethics? Um, the main idea here is I regard ethics as the fundamental values from which autonomous agents uh, make their decisions. So they're not necessarily moral. Honor among thieves is an ethic, uh, but so are the Asilomar principles for AI development. And um, autonomous car valuing the life of a pregnant woman over an older person, say, that's one choice that has to be programmed in. That's an ethic. More complicated examples, uh, if you go through the Department of Defense documents on use of coercion and warfare, uh, very extensively worked out um, as, as precisely as possible. Uh, so those are sets of ethics. The main thing here is the, a, a set of transparent ethics would be embedded in a distributed ledger technology um, system so that they, they're transparent, they're available, and they're uh, not hackable. And changes in the ethics, like changing the US Constitution, say, would be only um, possible through a consensus of the uh, major stakeholders. Now, morality, um, it sounds like this would be interesting to Allison to discuss. Uh, I'm, I'm just going to put it very simply that in the long history of morality, you know, there's, there's just so many uh, takes on it. But in, for me, there's only two fundamental um, flavors, a system that seeks only voluntary exchanges and a system where one group's set of values is imposed over all the other groups. So I favor the voluntary system. <clears throat> I think it fosters uh, far more diversity and there's far more local computation that are done than in the coercive systems uh, where you have a cent you know, more centralized control. And the balance of power that I envision in a group of competing and cooperating AGIs would seem to be easier to preserve and evolve with a uh, voluntary system. Another axiom would be a behavior control system. Um, I'm not an expert in this area, um, but um, behavior obviously is the complete set of input output functions. Uh, a good example that is intelligible to me is a behavior tree. So the, in a behavior tree, uh, the fundamental values are at the roots. Those are what I would call the ethics or the fundamental values from which the autonomous agents decisions are derived. And um, an unhackable system would seem to me, an unhackable behavior control system would seem to me to be a necessary ingredient, ingredient of uh, safe AGI. Uh, the next group I'll put, um, I'll, I'll talk about these all together. The Internet of Things and barcodes, configuration items, identity authentication, and the audit trail. Um, for a number of reasons, we have to have a means to uniquely identify a component of not only AGI, but you know, what, what's going to become its extended peripheral system, uh, otherwise known as the rest of civilization, or as it's becoming uh, digitalized, the Internet of Things. And um, the danger of criminal access to AI or an AI impersonating a human or another AI um, means we have to have uh, you know, a means of identity authentication. Um, I'll just say there are a number, I think we're up to about a dozen of competing cryptocurrency ID, ID uh, authentication schemes. So that technology is under development. Um, when there's an AGI failure, as uh, Roman and uh, Nick Bostrom and Alexei Turchin describe in detail, uh, we need to know which component failed. So it's got to be identified by some kind of a barcode. Um, we need to know uh, um, if it's hijacked, uh, which component is it, who checked it out of the secure inventory, um, what is the audit trail on it. A configuration item, in case you're not familiar with that, is essentially it arose in uh, information technology and the fields of business continuity, planning, and disaster recovery. 
It's a self-contained description of how a component should be properly configured within a system. So, you know, think back to the days when we had to, if you can remember, uh, flip dip switches or whatever to connect a hard drive or whatever, that all became automated and the configuration item is what automates that. So when a system goes down, <clears throat> a configuration item also helps diagnose the failure and restore functionality. That's more of a intelligent configuration item. Um, so the software components of an autonomous agent of AGI can themselves be uh, stored in, in a distributed ledger. Uh, so accessing the critical, compo critical components of AGI could be like checking weapons out of a vault or you know, uh, some proprietary technology from, a, uh, from Microsoft or uh, Oracle or whatever. Smart contracts and social ostracism. So smart contracts are um, uh, originally, for instance, the idea of simply a vending machine. So what is a vending machine? You don't have a, a third party intermediary between the, the two um, parties of the transaction. It's simply you and the vending machine, but there's a type of automated contract there, a smart contract uh, that, that lets you put in your money and get out your, your uh, whatever you're buying. Other examples would be um, automated deposits in your bank account for work you've performed or payments of bills. Uh, these things uh, are automated because they, the conditions of the contract are fulfilled on both sides and then the automatic uh, transaction takes place. So when smart contracts are used in AI ecosystems, they're obviously going to be far more complex. And uh, what, I, what I mean by social ostracism is you need a way to automatically deny resources to errant uh, human or autonomous agents. Um, so as opposed to simply uh, they're denied access by contract, even though they have uh, uh, numerous automated contracts with uh, numerous participants in the ecosystem, uh, you, you would probably have automated ways of denying those resources once they violate their, their contracts. And uh, let, so let's turn to a couple epistemological issues. I don't know, you know, how uh, you would um, prove a uh, set of axioms is necessary and sufficient uh, to ensure AGI safety, uh, ensure AGI uh, ethical alignment with human ethics and morals. Um, I think several people have had a guess that uh, we need to have some kind of sandbox simulation. And of course, the questions, you know, a series of simulations, questions arise, well, why can't the AGI hack the simulations, report misleading results, and escape the sandbox? Um, the idea of um, Bohr et al., a group at IBM, was that simula simulation results can be stored in a distributed ledger. So in other words, uh, you'd have an unhackable report that's um, ex accessible only to certain parties of the results of the simulations. They were talking about in regard to um, important results such as from clinical trials that you don't want those to be hackable. But I think that can be applied as well to the simulations of uh, AGI. And uh, access to those uh, results or maybe even the simulation technology or, or looking at the simulations would require presenting a certificate of good standing, which itself would be stored via distributed ledger technology. And um, maybe that would be uh, sent, uh, the certificate of good standing would be sent via cryptocurrency token. So that's an example of a uh, smart contract. It's a specialized type of smart contract. And another uh, IBM group <clears throat> calls these suppliers declarations of conformity. So you might have the Asilomar principles uh, perhaps more concisely uh, encoded in a declaration of conformity that uh, last I looked, I don't know, 13 or 1400 AI workers around the world had signed on to. And presumably if you signed it, you'd have access to it. And again, your uh, proof that you have signed it would be encoded in DLT. And you could use that as a token to access uh, some AGI technology. Uh, so as you most likely know, um, Gödel's theorem implies that any finite set of axioms is fundamentally incomplete <clears throat> and Chaitin uh, he, he, he enlightened us as to a little bit about how that works. If you have finite set of axioms, uh, the, the, in terms of algorithmic information theory, the, 
the length of those uh, axioms is finite and you can only uh, uh, generate a finite number of theorems from those axioms. So what that implies to me is that there's not going to be a complete set of axioms for AGI um, morality and uh, safety. It's going to be an ongoing process. <clears throat> At some point, we'll have to pass the baton to the machines to extend the axiom system. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, currently we've got a legal system that in, in, in a sense constitutes a huge number of uh, heuristics generated by common law and all. Uh, Steve Omohundro had the very insightful idea that smart contracts could be used to bridge the gap between um, current legal systems and those that AGI creates and administers, translate human law into machine law. And essentially, I think that's uh, going to result in a much more concise set of axioms, but there's no, probably no limit to them. And the last thing I just want to say is that I think um, game theory and specifically mechanism design, uh, so the science and art of designing a communication system that incents the parties to cooperate uh, to generate certain categorical or qualitative goals uh, could replace several of the axioms and might be a more robust uh, starting point. And uh, maybe we have to give the machines at some point the, the, the task them with creating these uh, mechanisms or um, new types of games. So again, I thank you very much for the opportunity to present the work. I welcome any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, I think you really, um, um, I guess, like gave a good overview of the different principles. I would love to, uh, in the discussion, maybe talk a little bit about um, towards the ending of your paper, you uh, kind of like make a few really interesting, I think, um, I guess, predictions or considerations that we have to take into account uh, in getting into into that world. Uh, but for now, I would uh, and, and I encourage people to read up on that if you want. It's the last part of the of the paper. Maybe we can get to that in a bit, given that we also have David Munhan here. Um, and uh, for now, I would love to see if Zünke uh, would like to kick us off with his presentation before I, I unmute both Chris and Zünke, and you can ask your questions to both of them. Uh, so Zünke, I think uh, you should be able to speak now. Let's see what your Wi-Fi situation is like. Yes. Uh, can you hear me better now? Very well. Okay. And so now you, you want me to start with the, my presentation? That would be fantastic. Yes. Sh sure. Okay. So thank you so much and sorry for the inconvenience earlier. Um, so this paper um, is related to the demand for AI policies and we were inspired by a paper from Bostrom et al. 2018, which is called Policy Desiderata for Super Intelligent AI. And um, in this paper, he also, or they also talk about interests of digital minds. And there's one desideratum, which I quote, mind crime prevention, advanced AI is governed in such a way that maltreatment of sentient digital minds is avoided or minimized. So this is basically what our article is about to address this desideratum. Um, so the focus is not only on digital minds, but on sentient digital minds. And um, so the definition of sentient is that um, it's a mind which has the um, capacity to perceive qualia, including unpleasant qualia such as pain. And, and so the, the mind is able to suffer and suffering of any sentient being is a significant issue and may even increase in the future dramatically. So um, that's why um, this is something important to look at. Um, in terms of sentient digital minds, we focus mostly on AIs, but this could be also like subroutines, even characters in video games, simulations, uploads of human minds. So any sentient digital minds in the, as, a, as a subset of the vast, um, vast set of overall space of minds. We are fully aware that this is currently very much speculation but um, since there's a non-zero possibility for the existence of suffering sentient digital um, minds, um, we believe that Bostrom's et al's um, desideratum makes very much sense. And uh, to try um, to look at how um, my treatment of those minds can be avoided or minimized. So while many AI policies are currently short-term, this is obviously a, a more long-term one. 
And again, another quote from Bostrom, um, it is plausible that the vast majority of all minds that will ever have existed will be digital. So um, if this is um, realistic, then it, it's even more important to look at this. Again, um, in, this, um, in this article, we don't look um, at the question whether there are, um, whether a sentient suffering digital minds exist. We assume um, that this is the case and we instead um, explore how to measure and specify suffering or well-being of digital minds, which would be then a require, which would be a requirement um, to um, to figure out how to prevent it and develop um, policies accordingly. We um, also stress very much another motivation we have for this article, and this is that in the history of mankind, humans have caused already immense suffering by recognizing ethical issues only um, very late and delaying policies. Cruelty to animals and, and slavery are only a few examples. So um, we hope also um, to, to, to contribute um, to, to um, not to repeat um, previous mistakes. And that's why we, we thought it's important to address the topic of AI welfare um, timely and early. So um, in this article, we try to um, present the relevant groundwork for what we call AI welfare science. And this is actually derived from the, from the um, term animal welfare science. And then based on this, there could be AI welfare policies. Because I have, not, um, I have only um, 15 minutes here, I, I focus on the um, welfare science part and not so much on the policies. And we um, have formulated two um, basic questions. The first would be, how can my treatment of sentient digital minds be specified? And then how could the, um, can the maltreatment of sentient digital minds be prevented or stopped? Um, this is obviously, again, all um, very challenging at this stage, but we, we look at um, um, early steps. And um, for the AI welfare science, we um, look at two different components. The first would be um, the interest of digital minds to avoid um, suffering, and second, the interest of digital minds to have the freedom of choice about their deletion to be deleted. So first, the, the first component, and later I talk about the second one, first about suffering of digital minds. So what can be done about this? Um, one approach could be um, similar to um, what is um, the, the work of uh, David Pierce about um, abolitionism. So he, he's um, looking into this, as, as many of you may, may know, um, for, for um, humans and non-human um, animals. But um, this could be, we, we were wondering if this could be extended to um, also to digital minds. And maybe this is even less challenging. It's, it's anyway very challenging, but it could be less challenging for digital minds for two reasons, perhaps. Because um, currently there may not be too many sentient digital minds uh, have them have been created yet, if at all, unless we already live in a simulation. So therefore, the task may be mostly to prevent suffering um, when creating new um, sentient digital minds. And this may be easier than re-engineering them retroactively, as is, would be the case for, for um, suffering animals, for instance. And um, then, the, secondly, the genetic code, which determines animal cruelty and suffering, has evolved over a long period of time, and therefore interventions are more, uh, more complex than um, adjusting perhaps more transparent AI software code written by humans, at least in the initial stage. So this would be our, our first aspect. We consider um, if it is possible to abolish um, suffering at, um, completely. This would be obviously, um, if this was successful, this would be one way to, to avoid the suffering. If this is not, um, if suffering um, of digital minds cannot be abolished um, easily, then um, the next um, challenge for us is how to measure it at all. And um, again, we compare with humans and, and animals. So uh, one um, important way to, to measure um, pain for humans in, in, usually or also other beings is self-reporting. Because in order to handle pain, it must be detected, located, and quantified. And um, for humans, um, self-reporting is an important method, at least for the detection and location, quantification to some extent. Um, so um, 
So what about um, self-reporting um, as, as a method to measure um, suffering? Um, there are two challenges at least. Um, the first one is also, um, so the first challenge would be that um, there are patients who are unable to um, self-report at least at least accurately the, the, the pain. Um, this would also apply to animals, but also certain humans, like uh, humans with dementia or um, infants and babies. Um, they cannot precisely self-report the pain. And secondly, there could be biases, um, plenty of biases um, when it comes to self-reporting, um, like response bias or social desirability bias. And this, the second point may be also quite relevant for AI um, self-reporting of pain because they, they obviously could um, um, fake um, fake um, suffering and um, if they deem this beneficial for um, pursuing their um, priorities. So this may be not reliable self-reporting. Instead, um, we believe that um, a better method would be like in general in science um, to um, do, um, do it um, through observation, um, to observational pain assessment. And, um, and here again, it, um, we look at the, we look um, at animal um, welfare science because animal welfare science, it's, it, this is also a, um, an important method that they, um, uh, that they look at observational indicators for, to measure um, pain of animals. And um, there are basically two um, parameters, um, functional and behavioral parameters in, in animal welfare science. And we believe that this may be an, a useful approach and um, this may be even more um, effective for for um, digital beings than for animals because um, of the um, digital nature of, of these um, these beings to look at, at certain parameters. So when it when it comes to so I looked at the, the two types of parameters now. The first one, the functional parameters. Um, Already now, AI algorithms have a number of functional parameters, like um, regarding the, the resources or the time or storage efficiency. So um, maybe it is possible to also identify um, parameters to in that indicate uh, suffering, or at least at this stage, um, through a collection of, of data, there can be um, the data could be collected, and retroactively, um, it may be possible to identify indicators for suffering of, of those beings. When it comes to behavioral um, parameters, suffering can be caused either by, uh, um, pre uh, by presence of negative um, reinforcers or absence of positive reinforcers. And these would be also certain, certain behaviors we could look at and even could, uh, came up, could come up with a preference tests for AI algorithms um, to, to see um, if there are, to identify positive or negative reinforcers. So based on these, considerations, we came up um, with five recommendations, um, very um, early basic recommendations, we, um, which could be useful for AI welfare science um, and, and to look um, further into. The first recommendation, I'm quoting them all now, um, maybe Alison, if you don't mind, maybe you can even um, copy them into the chat. But so I'll quote them now, recommendation one, um, initiate research on AI welfare science to develop methods to create only non-suffering sentient digital beings and um, digital minds which cause no suffering. So then and, and this would be the, the abolitionist approach. Um, if there's no um, suffering, this would be, of course, ideal. Um, second recommendation would be initiate research on AI welfare science to develop methods to re-engineer existing suffering sentient digital beings to become permanently non-suffering or um, existing digital um, minds not to cause any suffering anymore. Third recommendation, initiate research on AI welfare science to develop methods to measure through observation the suffering of sentient digital minds. So um, this is about how to, to measure. And um, number four, initiate research on AI welfare science to develop methods to cure the suffering of sentient di digital minds. So, so obviously after measuring it would be the helpful next step to cure it also. And then the fifth one, and I don't have much time to elaborate on this, but um, regulate the creation of sentient digital minds which are doomed to suffer. 
I'm happy if this is of any interest. I'm happy to talk about this more in the in, in the um, in the discussion. So this was the the first component of AI welfare science. Um, so the suffering of digital minds. And now briefly for the last few minutes, I talk about the other component, which is the deletion of digital minds. What if um, certain digital minds have an interest not to be deleted in the same way as humans and other animals have an interest not to die? Um, again, a spec um, speculation, but um, this is um, already indirectly introduced by Omohundro um, in, um, in his um, four um, likely drives for AIs. There, one of those drives is also self-preservation, which kind of intra, um, could be also rephrased in a way that um, um, AIs and may have an interest not to be deleted. Um, so there's obviously um, some difference, a difference to, to humans and other animals who have a um, finite lifespan usually, while um, digital minds could have a potentially indefinite lifespan. And um, this would also mean if um, the wish for non-deletion of those minds would be granted, that this um, would create significant computational costs in the light of easy culpability and potentially mass number of digital minds. And also another distinction has to be made, um, whether um, a mind, between turning off a digital mind or, and keeping its code or, and the history or destroying the code. It's because um, it could be also that um, the digital mind is, um, could be de deleted, but then um, rebooted again if the, if the code and the history is kept. Um, so we um, also came up um, with uh, recommendations related to deletion of digital minds. And two recommendations, I'm quoting them also here. This would, the first one would be, um, do not uh, delete sentient digital minds if this is not in their interest. And second, um, delete irrevocably or temporarily by storing code and history um, sentient digital minds if they wish for it, but are unable to do it themselves. So the second recommendation kind of resembles um, the request for um, euthanasia. So if, if, a, if a mind wishes, digital mind wishes to be deleted, but um, has no means to, to do it. Um, again, both of these um, recommendations face, um, there's again the issue of the, um, which was discussed before, the communication challenge, how to communicate um, with those de um, minds. And which shows again, this is also um, speculative again. So I, I very briefly summarize. Um, we, I, I talked, I introduced this, this um, the two topics of AI welfare science, which um, which would be suffering of um, um, digital beings and um, the, um, the interest not to be deleted. And um, in order um, to to come up with policies, um, which would be anyway very long-term um, considerations, we believe it's, it's still um, possible to do some theoretical groundwork and um, to at least to, to find ways to measure um, suffering or, or into, uh, to find out the interests of digital minds. And um, again, our second important motivation for this was that um, humans have to take the blame to have, um, to have been laid in the past um, when it comes um, to the abolishment of discrimination, acceptance of comprehensive anti-speciesism and sentiocentrism. And so um, we think it's important not to repeat this mistake again, even if um, right now it's um, um, speculation, but uh, there is some probability. In terms of future work, there's obviously lots of future work to be done. And um, first of all, one part would be to come up with AI welfare policies. And again, this is, was the um, second part of, um, or is the second part of our paper, but um, I, for now I didn't have the time to talk about it, but we could talk about it in the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you so, so much. Okay, this was fantastic. I feel like there's a lot of overlap and a lot of, I, I think, bits that we could um, kind of like tie out in both of your presentations. Um, so, so if I, I I'm, I'm gonna try to, um, see if there's a connection between uh, your, your both presentation. You can tell me if I'm right or wrong, and maybe we can start the discussion with that. So it seems to me that uh, Chris is uh, much more skeptical that we can make uh, elaborate guesses about uh, what it is that artificial minds may be feeling. 
So if I can kind of like, uh, I guess, uh, um, if I can butcher both of you guys' presentations a little bit and see if there's an overlap. So Zünke, you know, I am, I think after having read, uh, you know, Age of M or other or other books, or even reading the hedonistic imperative, right? Like when uh, when um, uh, when Pierce talks about the very very far future and what we the k kinds of emotions that we may be able to experience, and when Robert Hansen talks about the different computational speeds that will be available to machines and how that may influence the types of experiences they'll be having, that they'll be having, I think one can be quite ske skeptical uh, about whether or not it, there is anything what it's like to be that thing that we can uh, we can imagine. And I think David pointed out that you know how can we even make sure that they have quality or that they're not just gaming us. So I think given that that skepticism then one can still ask, okay, is there anything that we can, uh, we can, is there, is there, are there any heuristics that we can use to realize whether or not something is in their interest? Um, and I think then coming back from that, um, uh, I think Chris has the notion of, okay, well, something is in someone's interest um, if they engage in that interaction voluntarily. So I think without knowing really anything about the mind architecture, you can at least know that uh, you know, likely it is in, in their interest or it increases their welfare if they, if they, if that agent in, engages in an interaction voluntarily. And if that's so, then, you know, can we put in, uh, an architecture of like laws or of like smart contracts in place that would bind the emerging intelligences into our already existing societal infrastructure in a way where it was possible for them to make interactions voluntarily so that, so that we could say basically it is in their interest. Um, so I'm feeling that, you know, you're, um, uh, you're you're attacking the like a similar type of problem, but I think Chris is much more skeptical that we can uh, even find very much out in AI welfare science and says, okay, given that that may be hard, uh, are there uh, certain are there certain contracts um, that uh, that we can put in place? And I think you know if you only take the two principles as uh, sorry Zinka with which you started, which is um, you know can we specify maltreatment of sentient digital minds and how can we prevent it? Well, one way, you know, uh, to prevent it then perhaps is by really just uh, giving those rights uh, in, in a smart contract format uh, that would uh, allow those uh, uh, agents to self-report their welfare by, uh, in, uh, by engaging or not engaging in interactions with others. Is that like one way of trying to combine the two? And perhaps, Chris, you can uh, take a go at it and then, uh, Zunke, you can answer. <laughs> sure, sure. Um, I think you articulate my position better than I do. But, uh, you know, I, I think we start with where we are now. So uh, in, in neuroscience, there are two different types of pain signaling pathways. There's a uh, lateral discriminatory signaling pathway. Uh, and, and, there's, and that is simply, you might say, the unemotional uh, objective signal of, uh, oh, my hand is near the stove and it's hot, but you don't feel badly or, or good about it. There's the medial effective pathway, and that's where the amygdala, amygdala gets involved. And that uh, is the judgment call, and that's where I, I think this uh, theory that Sinka is developing would apply, that you could have a machine which uh, replicates that pathway, might have far more complex uh, feelings than we do, um, or not. You might design a machine that does not have that pathway. Uh, there are some people who love lobster and say, well, the lobsters don't have the uh, effective pathway, only the discriminatory, so it's okay to cook them. Um, so, and then there's the, I agree with what you're saying about, uh, you didn't use the term reveal preferences, but when individuals interact, they reveal their preferences by their transaction and how much they're willing to risk uh, in, in a transaction. So, um, and self-reporting, there's a VAS scale where you're reporting on a scale of 10, you know, how... I was just talking to this with our lab head yesterday uh, that down in the one, two, three of the VAS, uh, you really, uh, the, the studies show you can't really tell whether you're at a one or two or a three. But when you start getting up to the five, six, seven, certainly eight, nine, ten, it's a very strong signal. So I would think we would start with those tools. And like you said, Allison, pain can be seen as subjective and self reporting. Uh, although uh, Sinka pointed out the problem of people who are in cognitive decline or um, you know, have some issues with being able to report or accurately report. And the, the machines would have to be endowed with a mission of how do you take those initial tools and um, a set of principles that uh, minimize uh, that uh, affective component of pain. Uh, and then someone else put, you know, you have to have some kind of a strong signal, though pain is that without any pain, you're, you're not going to survive. 
So there has to be a way to gauge that uh, scaling of the pain signal. And the machines would um, take that set and evolve a new, uh, you know, more, more advanced uh, control system. I hope that's helpful. Thanks. Zünke, would you like to respond? Sure. And of course, um, Roman is also welcome, welcome to, to add. Um, yeah, he can, um, Roman, you can unmute yourself anytime, by the way. I made you yeah. call. No, um, and uh, I think also, as, as I pointed out, of, of course, uh, I'm also, sc I'm skeptical and I had no, we, we know, say nowhere in our paper that we have the slightest evidence yet. Um, it is very much, I guess, this, this imperative um, to reduce suffering. And even if there are only small probabilities, um, that's why I try to emphasize also this, this um, um, angle um, to avoid um, suffering. I mean, that there are some uh, um, approaches or theories that in the, the suffering in, in the future will be, will be much, much, there will be much more um, suffering in the, in the future and there, there, there's risks of astronomical suffering. So um, we, we look at this from this, um, even if there's a low probability um, and, and, and not much evidence yet, but from this angle to, re to reduce suffering and um, to, to take preliminary steps um, at an early stage and, and again based on the, the history that humans were often very late and um, when it came on and, and only realized that after they um, did um, already the suffering. So we thought um, it's time to be um, ahead of the curve. Um, yeah, I think, um, you know, one thing is that uh, if you care about, like, oh, let's say, like, I think uh, caring about suffering already presupposes, you know, I, I guess somewhat of an utilitarian framework, right? And if you are trying to do like a, like a, I guess, like a, an ethical framework that accounts for intelligences that, that are very differently than uh, that's already presupposing utilitarianism to some extent. But I think even within that, you could say that, okay, well, maybe for artificial minds, the best way that we can really get to self-reporting their happiness is by if they uh, engage with uh, in, into, an, uh, into an interaction voluntarily. You know, so I think, you know, there's usually at least we have like, some information that uh, they consent to what's going on. And, um, and, and, you know, you could even kind of classify that further by enabling more and more voluntary interactions um, for machines by enabling or by binding them into, let's say, like a distributed ledger uh, ecosystem, uh, you could uh, really enable them to decide freely for themselves. And that is kind of a re revealed preference. I want to say one thing about revealed preferences, which is something that, you know, is often coming up in terms of human revealed preferences. You know, I think, um, oh, I forgot the, the name for this, but uh, it's basically uh, where you have like hidden preferences. So basically sometimes it, it, it is the case that we have social dynamics in which uh, you know, we, you may have a preference, but you don't really feel like you can reveal them in the given context. And then the moment that uh, the social setting changes in a way where suddenly you are able to reveal them, you actually reveal it. And that sometimes switches and whole societies kind of like switch from one bucket into the next one. So I think even uh, if you just take review preferences in, in economics, you know, there's a ton of problems with that. But um, if you only take review preferences, let's say, as a, you know, as an example here, then um, how can you, I guess, be sure that uh, review preferences aren't being gamed uh, and that they, or that they don't lead kind of like, you know, long-term into, I don't know, like races to the bottom or, you know, multipolar traps and, in the way that there is something that we would all enlighten, or that all agents, artificial and human, would all enlightenedly prefer uh, if they could, but they are locked into you know an inadequate equilibrium of some sorts, and they just can't get themselves to coordinate in that direction. That's I think usually one thing that you like one objection that you get to that approach, Chris. Can I respond briefly? Uh, so, the point of mechanism design. The reason I focused it on. Uh, Mechanism design is the part of um, game theory where you're designing a communication system. So you um, either reveal those preferences or uh, you, ins you incent the players to act in concert even though they don't reveal their preferences. But okay. your, your, point, your point is very well taken. It's a profound point. Well, it is like like I was immediately thinking when reading that. Okay, what do I usually get in terms of objections when I speak about like a you know related theory? And I think one thing that you get is definitely races to the bottom of like you know multi-agent dynamics and how they how they uh, play out. Um, and then another thing uh, is you know 
I guess one of the main problems for your approach would be also something like a civil attack, right? So how can you actually make sure that those agents, uh, you know, aren't colluding in ways that you can't tell, uh, creating something like a single on the long run, right? So I think that's like, in, in, you know, in, in the crypto ecosystem, the civil attack is basically like the single danger in AI. So is there any way you can avoid that? I, you know, as I mentioned, I think simulations are going to be key. Uh, maybe I'm prejudiced because that's what I pretty much do for my day job. But I think um, that's, uh, you know, has to be an essential component. And you're, you're essentially going to try to think of as many use cases as you can to run through the simulation. And uh, the AI, you know, again, I think that it's a passing of the baton. It's hoisting uh, ourselves by our bootstraps by turning some of the problems over to AI. And okay. uh, Ted Howard, Ted, yeah, we should read Ted Howard uh, had a comment here. Well, how, why do you why do you think you'd be able to dictate anything to the machines? Yes, exactly. I mean, at some point, uh, that's that's the huge problem. So we have to put the pieces in place before that happens. All right, thank you so much. Okay, we have uh, two previous questions. Uh, I, I'm asking, please, if you have a question for the speakers, please uh, preface them with a cue so I can direct them and find them easy in the chat. Um, Zunke, would you like to respond? No, for, for, uh, to, to what question, no. I just wanted to give you a chance because I was ranting like a little earlier, right? <laughs> and then we switched to Chris. So if you had no, any- No, 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 for, for, no, no, I'm fine, thanks. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I have to make sure that uh, I'm not ranting too much. Yeah. Well, um, okay, so I, I did wanna, uh, I guess, uh, okay. So there is, I guess, um, a way in which, um, in which, uh, and I'm coming back to Chris in this regard, something like an automated um, distributed ledger ecosystem is in itself something like a singleton, right? So it is in itself by, specify, by specifying any set of laws into this uh, distributed ledger singleton. Uh, on the one hand, what it is, is that, um, you know, you have to agree on something. And I think you're, you're saying that by right, this kind of constitution like setting uh, at the outpost on which you have to agree on. So that in itself might be a danger, right? It may be a runaway single, or even even so, because I think one of the main um, I think criticisms that you get for any type of single AI approach is usually that um, any, uh, any, any such, um, any such, any such endeavor will uh, create massive first strike instabilities by you know the moment that you get something that could become a single, and you have a lot of actors suddenly that are trying to prevent you from uh, ever reaching that point because it's very uh, it, it's quite dangerous for those actors, right? Even if you could tell them, oh no, actually it's in all of you guys' interests uh, to to be able to opt into the super intelligent AI, uh, they may not, uh, for good reasons, uh, believe you. So uh, to me, you know, even something like a distributed um, uh, ledger uh, ecosystem is in itself almost like a singleton in the sense that you lock in via a smart contract, right, um, spe specific types of value. So given the fact that we currently are in an ecosystem where we're not in a totally, uh, where we're not there yet, you are already creating um, something like a transition risk into that state. Is there anything uh, you want to say to that? Yes, I mean, I agree with you that a single distributed ledger technology system like Bitcoin, say, uh, if, if no other distributed ledger could be created, that's a huge problem. But in fact, you've got a myriad of distributed ledger technologies and um, a myriad, uh, I mean, literally, uh, I don't know, um, maybe 10,000 that are competing and a whole bunch that are competing in a given, given area. So um, I don't have a, I cannot think of a solution to the singleton problem. I agree with you completely. But what I envision, I don't, and another uh, very interesting question would be, you know, how many, how much of a balance of power, how much of a distribution of resources uh, among a, a group of AIs, uh, AGIs, do you need to uh, ensure that their, their competition and their cooperation will be robust? You know, like the uh, statistic that you need, whatever it is, 63% of nodes in an internet, sufficiently broad internet, in order for the a message to be able to get from one point to the other reliably and below 63% or whatever the connectivity value is, that system will fail. So it's another question, not all of an answer, but it's an interesting question. What you know, level of distribution of resources among competing cooperating uh, autonomous agents is necessary for robust solution? Yeah, great. And I think we already have that in terms of like many of the treaties that we have, you have like compensating dynamics, you know, by which 
for a small number of, let's say, smaller players, it's uh, in their interest uh, to band together if they see, you know, like a, a larger player arising. So I think mm -hmm. having like a kind of like multipolar layout in that way, um, you know, could be beneficial. Meanwhile, you also then, you know, encounter the problems of like a, a world with high multipolarity in which, you know, you have the problems of small kills all. So in which like a small number of agents could, you know, potentially destroy like a large a large group of people, right? Which is often what you get, I think, in, in, in highly multipolar worlds. Um, do you have anything to say to that? Uh, no, I don't. I think you're <laughs> right, and I don't don't know enough to uh, offer a, uh, a solution or a critique. Okay. Well, I'm going to post like a, an article about that here, um, where Bossom is right. basically saying that we're going to enter semi-anarchic default conditions. Um, and in which, you know, potentially smaller actors have the number of causing greater harm, which I think you currently see really well, right, with the coronavirus uh, crisis in the way that, like, you know, you have cascading effects to even, like, the actions of a small number of folks. Um, and uh, then I think we did a salon in which I basically um, proposed, like, a more decentralized solution for tackling um, small kills all scenarios, uh, which don't rely on like singletons in terms of uh, either governance systems or in terms of uh, artificial agents. But I'll post it. In, I'll post it here in the chat, um, the link to the talk as well. And uh, Zunke, did you uh, did you want to did you have a, an immediate co uh, comeback to this? Otherwise, I would get uh, get to a question by Forrest Laundry. No, please go ahead. Okay, great, awesome. So Forrest, I'm going to try to find and unmute you. Um, it would be amazing if the people that would like to ask a question have video on. Okay, here you go. Unmuted. Welcome. Hi there. Um, so this is uh, just building on a question uh, that someone asked earlier. I've also done uh, quite a bit of uh, computer science work and stuff, and I've never encountered a system that I could regard as unhackable. Um, so for instance, if we were to do a distributed ledger technology and the algorithms, the crypto algorithms were to be implemented uh, as an algorithm on sub some substrate, um, usually we try to do some sort of secure uh, compute infrastructure for that because obviously if you have access to the to the wire and the states of the of the system um, then you can just read the keys right off of the right off of the, the, the physical substrate you can actually measure the the electric voltages off of the DRAM and stuff like that um, so you know given that um, AI doesn't potentially just doesn't occur by itself that it may have access to uh, all sorts of tools to basically, uh, just invade the classical compute infrastructure, it's it's hard for me to see how uh, a notion such as unhackable could be supported. Um, so given that there's a criticality of dependency upon uh, crypto infrastructures, uh, I guess what I'm wondering is, 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 is are we presuming something that, that, that we don't really have a concept of how to substantiate? Uh, do you want me to answer, Allison? Okay. Uh, well, I mean, you raise uh, an absolutely valid point. Um, I mean, the, the I think that the comeback is that there is a huge and growing uh, cryptocurrency, um, crypto token community, and there's a um, co-evolution going on between the hackers and the security experts. Uh, I think you know much more about this than I do, um, but uh, you know what I observe is that there has been some uh, successful hacking. And uh, the, the, then the uh, security experts um, on the uh, cryptocurrency side come up with a solution um, that extends the basic idea that if you're going to have, uh, you know, a set of nodes that uh, as opposed to one sing single point of failure, if you're going to have a distributed set of nodes, so some robustness where even if, you know, a bunch of nodes can go down, but the rest of them can, out of their own self-interest, uh, say, well, we're, we're not I mean, in, in some cases, they can just roll back the ledger to the point of the hack, and they've done this, and uh, restore the ledger from that point going forward. Um, so I think there are solutions being developed for, um, you know, the, the, the problem of uh, hacking. Zunke, do you have a reply to that? No, thank you. I guess, you know, all that I would say to that is, like, that's a problem that you encounter building any type of AI. That is not a specific problem that is, uh, or that is not a problem that is subject to one uh, one approach versus another approach. It is just, I think, a problem that we have to get around to. And, you know, you don't, like, we always say in, you know, in the paper that we wrote on this, um, we basically say the level of intelligence that's required to destroy the world is already behind us. 
because given the fact that you know we have such insecurable computer security foundations already, it doesn't require very advanced <laughs> intelligences of the future or using nanotechnology or anything like that. Um, anyone, I mean, uh, like almost anyone uh, would be able to cause already massive damages to a computer security infrastructure. So the problem is even, even worse, I think, than you point out for us, and it's definitely a point well taken, and we have to get around to, um, to producing securable computer security infrastructures. That said, I also think that crypto commerce or the crypto ecosystem is a valuable approach to that, just because the, of the fact that insecurable crap dies early, right? Because uh, you know, if you uh, come up with a proposal or if, if you come up with any project uh, and it's easily hackable, then there's like a million dollar crypto bug bounty already attached to it, which makes people in the ecosystem go out and try to hack your system. So the fact that you know systems that are more secure survive longer in the cryptocurrency ecosystem is maybe uh, all we can do. It's play tested or red team by other approaches. And yeah. Anyway, this is just my my dissent on it. But uh, we had another question by uh, David Mannheim. Uh, David, I'm going to unmute you, and then Yasha, I saw your hand as well. <laughs> David, you are unmuted. Um, okay, so uh, I'm wondering about kind of two related things. The first one is. Um, I guess the, the more important one, um, if you have a blockchain securing your, um, you know, the, the kind of crown jewels for the AGI, whatever it is that we don't want it to be able to change, don't you have to worry about the AGI um, fundamentally breaking the crypto system that um, is being used to secure the blockchain? Um, and even if not, it seems like um, the way that proof of stake works makes it arbitrarily expensive to keep the system secure if the AI system itself can um, create or get access to compute power to compete for dominance of the system. I think that's, uh, those are both valid points. Um, I think the, the latter one uh, again, argues against a, a singleton or something that moves toward, uh, you know, uh, too much resources being concentrated in, um, you know, one or a small group's hands. Um, I mean, that's, I think that's uh, all I can say. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'm guessing it rests on the assumption that there is no one such AGI that, uh, you know, that, that could look at the code, because then the civil problem supposedly would have, would have been broken ever. <laughs> I mean, we can use AI itself. You know, AI could replace the current hackers to try to hack the uh, the crypto system. Um, uh, you know, David, go for it. You wanted to you wanted to say more. I think I'm going to unmute you just in case. No, I, I I think that that was that was it. Okay. But thank you. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's fine. I was thinking about saying something, but I'm good. I, All right. I, can I make one more point? Uh, okay. Uh, you know, to, relative to both your and, and Forrest's, uh, you know, very valid criticisms, um, you could say, uh, well, what happens when we have quantum computing if they can make that practicable? It's headed in that direction, but it looks like it's a ways off. Um, I can send it out to everyone, but Scott Aronson actually, uh, either he came up with it or, or he um, in a set of slides he has uh, said, well, at that point, there is a solution that's, uh, my memory is it's, you go back to something like a one key pad for every transaction. Uh, so, uh, I mean, that, that I'm not expert in that field, but I think, um, you know, the, the, the prospect is there to develop, continue to develop the technology and in a co-evolution system, it will necessarily co-evolve. All right, thank you so much. Yosha, I'll unmute you next. Thanks, Alison. Can you hear me? Good. Um, I suspect that the entire argument suffers by the difficulty of understanding the ontological status of pain. Basically, a large part of the philosophical community has an issue with understanding the nature of consciousness and experience. And so it's uh, often not easy to explain what it means that a system suffers from pain but, uh, to, uh, or suffers and experiences pain. So if we uh, look at AI, what I think what we can say is that our mind itself is not experiencing pain, it's generating the pain and projecting it into the self model. And in the self model, this is where the pain is registered. Pain is virtual 
physical systems cannot experience pain. Pain is not a physical property of any physical system. It's a simulated property. And uh, it's required because uh, for organisms because it tells the organism which situations are unbearable, which situations it cannot expose itself to because otherwise it would. And uh, you can transcend pain. A lot of um, human beings have managed to do that by going to a stage where they're able to edit their source code to such a degree that pain turns into an information stimulus rather than something that makes the situation unbearable, which means they learn to control pain. There is no reason why we should build a superhuman AI that is not able to control its pain, or um, more so if we build superhuman AI, it will be very difficult to make it continue to experience pain if it doesn't like it. And uh, so I, I think this should take a big role in our discussions. We can uh, definitely, I think, build systems that do not experience pain. And suffering is the result of not being able to regulate pain, especially in situations where the gradient of the uh, reinforcement signal that pain constitutes is not pointing into any direction where you can resolve it. Right? So uh, suffering is usually the result of some part of your brain tra sending a training signal to another part of your brain, and that part of the brain that is being trained not being able to fix the situation. And uh, so the signal gets cranked up, and the pain becomes stronger and stronger, and the situation becomes more and more unsufferable. But this uh, experience of pain only happens within a model, and that model can be changed if it's not appropriate, if it's not helping. And uh, it's difficult to do this in an organism that has, has not reverse engineered itself to a high degree. But this is not true for a technical system that we have designed in the first place or for a system that's able to reverse engineer itself. Uh, so uh, if, if you consider this, maybe you have a counter argument to this perspective and you think uh, I completely misunderstand the nature of pain here, or how would it change your argument? Yes, uh, thank you very much uh, for this point, uh, Joshua. Um, I, I think we, we partly addressed this in, in, in a part of our paper and which I couldn't introduce here in this short presentation. If you would like to look at our paper, there's also a scenario where we talk about um, precisely like there could be AIs that are smart enough um, to get rid um, of pain and um, to overcome pain. And then um, for these, um, these um, kind of AIs, this would not be applicable. But then we also note that um, we look at all types of um, potentially sentient digital minds, including those um, which are not, um, there could be um, minds conceivable, which are not very smart, but um, are able to, to suffer, um, but, the, who are, but who are not um, super intelligent, but um, may suffer. This is not an answer, I believe, to, to the um, philosophical questions um, about the nature of pain, and, and I agree with you that this, these are open questions, but at least I think partly an answer that, um, yes, um, there could be digital minds, very smart ones, who precisely do what you could do what you have described and don't feel any pain because of this, but there could be also less smart but um, suffering um, digital minds. Um, and um, and for, those, for this, um, still, this would be applicable, what we are talking about in terms of AI welfare science. So, Gesha, do you think you can, on accident, build minds that are suffering? Do you think there may already be minds, like in the Brian Tomasic style sense, there are already uh, computer minds out there that are suffering? Or do you think it's... Um, do, you think, do you think it's impossible to do it? Or do you think it's economically not really viable in the Robin Hanson style? So why would you? Okay, now I'm unmuted, thanks. <laughs> um, I suspect that it's harder to build accidentally minds that suffer. I suspect that functionality that you will put into the system could also be that if you use some kind of uh, evolutionary method um, that is basically where you don't construct the system, that uh, the system builds this as this first default. But I think that a system that is governed directly by pleasure and pain rather than seeing them as instrumental to reaching its goals and then turning them off if they get in the way of reaching its goals. Um, it's basically an early stage model. So in some sense, uh, pleasure and pain are mechanisms that exist for organisms that are governed by reflexes because they don't have models of their own control. And once you have a model of your own control system, uh, you realize that basically uh, just as um, cookies are a tool to make you eat your vegetables and you only need them as long as you don't eat your vegetable for other reasons. 
the pleasure signals are cookies that are made in your own brain for yourself. And pain signals are um, likewise uh, spices that are made in your own brain to keep you on track. And once this becomes completely instrumental to something else, you can turn it off and uh, replace it directly by what you want to do. And so I, I think that uh, pleasure and pain uh, probably will be built into early stage systems only or emerge in early stage systems. And uh, I don't think that they are very useful for systems that have uh, high level control models of their own control. Okay, and something like um, being prevented from achieving your goal. So let's say, you know, being prevented from, you know, achieving one of the, like it's a Humohundo uh, drives, like it, whatever goal a system has, just being prevented from achieving it. Um, that may, would that be some, like whether or not that's suffering, uh, you know, there's the prevention from, uh, from, from the goal that the agent is seeking. So how would you classify that? Would you well, yeah, the thing is, does it help you if you suffer? If it doesn't help you that you suffer and you are suffering, then you have a problem with self-regulation, right? And obviously uh, humans and other organisms do have these problems with self-regulation because typically we don't get easily to the point where we're able to regulate our own pain generation. But uh, we notice this in early stages when you are a, a two-year-old uh, human and you are unable to reach your goal, you will intensely suffer and you will throw tantrums even if the goal is physically impossible in this universe. And at some point you realize you can let go of that thing and you can instead pick another goal which is even more desirable and focus on that one. And uh, the ability to take charge of what you feel about a thing is part of becoming an adult. And uh, there are things that are very difficult to transcend, especially physiological impulses, but this is the way it's wired up because those are our ancestors, which didn't have uh, things that, uh, that basically prevented them uh, from uh, putting their hand into a hot fire, uh, didn't reproduce as well as those who did. And so it's much, much harder to transcend the basic level control mechanisms. But uh, if you take a step back from the whole thing and you understand what you're here for and what you want and why you want it, you don't need pain signals. It's also, I suspect, something that many of us feel, the better we are integrated, the less likelihood exists that we are suffering. Because we understand why things are the way they are and we can focus our attention on the things that we can change so we become more stoic. More stoic. Okay, I yeah. just posted an article on 31 laws of fun for utopias and why utopias doesn't have to be boring, which reminded me very much of what you said. Um, uh, okay, great. We have Dekai uh, next. Uh, I'll mute you. Can you hear me? Yes? Oh, okay. Yeah, um, thanks. Uh, interesting discussion. I, uh, I, you know, First of all, I think something that's obvious to a lot of people on here is that we have to be careful about making assumptions about the architecture of, of future AGIs, um, that uh, a lot of the assumptions about how they're programmed um, are, I think, based on still too many outdated assumptions about how, how procedural software is built. Um, and that's not how modern uh, machine learning uh, is already, and it's certainly not going to be uh, as we go forward. So I, I do have a big question in my mind, how much of this is actually implementable because I don't think that we can build it in, in those kinds of logical procedural ways. Um, to um, the point that Forrest was making, um, I agree as somebody who's built so much software over the decades that um, um, assuming that we can lock down the security of these things is pretty much goes against uh, empirically everything that we've seen. Um, and yet, if we assume that the architecture of these learning systems is indeed going to be very, very, very different from past software systems, and that's highly decentralized com computation, it may be difficult for hackers to actually, I mean, they can certainly interfere with the computations, but it's not clear that they could do so with any understanding of how they were doing it. Uh, so like, just as if you go in and you start inserting probes into a human's brain and you start you know, um, uh, sending signals there, yeah, you're interfering with the brain, but it's not clear that you can do so in a way that achieves any specific outcome that you're after. So that may be one way to deal with the security problem. Um, but uh, what I really wanted to talk about was uh, in some ways following up what Yosha was just talking uh, about, which is again, so, so I have a reservation um, 
that um, whether it's even a bad thing uh, for an AI to um, be suffering. Um, and maybe this is partly from uh, Asian culture. Um, it, it's not clear to me that elimination of suffering completely is the right thing to do. I think if you build an AI that's not able to, not, not only able to suffer, but that uh, is constrained so that it has no choice but to suffer, then, it, then you'll end up eventually building an um, artificial psychopath or an artificial sociopath. And I, it's not clear to me that that's good. The, the fact that an AI is forced into existential suffering of some type is necessary for it to be empathetic to humankind. And it, ultimately, AIs that are not empathetic to humankind are never going to be something that uh, address um, the challenges that uh, AGI coordination and strategy uh, is asking about. Zunko or Chris, do you want to answer? Um, very, uh, very briefly about the, the, the last point about the, um, yes, thank you very much. Um, I have to think more about it. We briefly touch on this in, in our paper, and I hadn't talked about it. Yes, um, because also we are, um, there, there are humans also um, who are ready to suffer for certain goals. There's this, this theme, um, no pain, no gain, um, like even for like sport activities, religious um, or spiritual um, achievements. So there's, um, there's certain suffering which is, could be considered um, helpful or useful to achieve goals. And um, we, we, um, we, we mentioned it, but um, I, I have to think, um, think more about it. This is certainly an important point, um, but perhaps uh, to some extent exceptional. Just want to say that what I'm talking about is not even really about achieving goals. I mean, I think this discussion has, has been framed in a way that's very much about um, goal, uh, goal-oriented behavior. And of course, you know, we, we know how to program uh, those kinds of systems. Uh, but again, uh, it's not entirely clear to me that that is the way to align AGIs uh, if they're not um, uh, sufficiently um, empathetic to the plight of humans uh, from direct experience. I mean, we, we don't really have any empirical examples of um, creatures that are empathetic to each other without have themselves going through the same personal um, experiences, the same personal mm -hmm. sufferings. This is why, for example, the Black Lives Matter movement is having so much trouble connecting to uh, subpopulations that have never had to experience what they go through. Yeah, I think, um, Chris. Uh, go ahead and then I'll no, you go first. I just want to fill in. All right, thank you. Well, I mean, to, to Kai's second point, so you use the term, you know, em empathetic or empathy several times. So I, uh, I mean, and you, and you said, uh, you know, the machines won't be empathetic unless they feel the same way. Yes, I mean, I think that's tautological in a sense, but I don't agree that that's the only way that machines could um, um, address human suffering. They just need a metric. Uh, again, I'd come back to reveal preferences in terms of a very sophisticated, scaled metric that is applied in a different way in you know innumerable um, contexts as as a way to uh, address that. Um, I had a point about your first response to your first point, but I don't remember it. So go ahead. I mean, I, yes, Chris. Thanks. Um, I mean, I, I know what you mean, and and that's the AI, you know, uh, approach that I was raised in, quote, raised in decades ago um, as a PhD student in, in Berkeley. And I have to say that I don't have uh, faith that that approach is really going to answer the questions that are posed by this track in AI, AGI um, strategy. Uh, there are too many ways that the goal, if you have built purely a goal-oriented system uh, that has no personal experience uh, that provides the uh, analogy uh, for the AGI to the human experience, there are too many ways the goals can go in the wrong directions in unintended ways. 
because the complexity of these uh, very logic, you know, goal-oriented uh, um, systems uh, is such that the, the way the, the combinatorial complexity of the rules explodes, um, there's always tons of unintended consequences that we cannot think through ahead of time. Um, and so it is really important that an AGI system have a way to self-define their objective function in terms of an experience which is very close to that of human experience. And yes, you could say, well, if, we, if the AGI could build a simulator of human experience that is so incredibly accurate that it can actually um, plan out how to make humans as happy as possible um, without actually experiencing it by itself, then I think we start getting into um, slightly meaningless debates about the difference between simulating something and actually experiencing it. Um, I mean, in a way, all AIs are simulating, um, but also one could turn around and argue that all humans are also just simulating. So, so that becomes, to me, kind of a pointless debate. Well, I think you're raising very good points, and and uh, you know, I, it, and as the machines evolve in very complex ways, uh, we're not going to be able to understand what they're doing. It's going to be beyond our ability. Um, also, just to add to your your points, the uh, some of the ones that Bostrom and others raise about uh, if the if the machines are given the mission of uh, make us as happy as possible, maybe they'll just create a drug that makes us as happy as possible, or you know, a transcranial electrical stimulation that. Make you know just it turns us into fools uh, who are happy all the time. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And th I mean that's the the simplest way to have an unintended consequence of any rules that we try to uh, build, goal oriented uh, uh, rule based systems that we try to build. So th this is exactly my concern about not having a close enough uh, experience of the AI uh, to the human experience. But so, you know, on the other hand, Zoom could come in and say, well, are you now proposing to create suffering agents, you know, purposefully suffering agents to some extent, right? And like, where's the ethics and like, for like, if, you, if you're purposefully going out and trying to, cre to create such a thing, right, then um, uh, so that we can get our needs met, I think Zoom would have one or two things uh, to say about that, right? I mean, I could throw Buddhist philosophy back at this. <laughs> okay. Well, I think like, like uh, one way I think in which, in which Chris could come back to that is just saying, "Hey, like I'm going to be agnostic toward the types of experiences you know that are uh, that are being created, but I'm just trying to put an architecture in place for an ecosystem in which we can engage with a variety of different agents, whether or not uh, you know they're suffering or whether or not what, whatever their mind makeup is. We don't even have to get into those problems and answer them. We just need to make sure that." the architecture with which we're interacting with them only allows for voluntary uh, interactions because uh, those are review preference style, uh, at least some way in which humans and artificial agents can self-report uh, whether or not an interaction is in their interest or not. It's, it's like, it's, it's, it's not very ambitious, you know, but, but uh, once you get more ambitious, you know, then you have to answer those really hard questions, I think, about consciousness that, um, that we haven't answered in long. Okay. So uh, we had Creon next, and uh, uh, I want to say, Chris and Zunke, at any point, like I, I, I check in with you if you're okay and going over time, but if at any point you have to drop off, just drop off, and, uh, and then uh, the questions will go into emptiness, and someone in the hive mind will pick it up uh, and discuss it. So, <laughs> so uh, Creon, I'm going to, uh, going to meet you. Um, let's see. Thanks, Allison. Uh, okay, so my question is kind of, I, you know, I'm not an expert in this this field of AGI and all this uh, mm -hmm. philosophy of AI, but it does seem to me that if we're going to take seriously the concept of suffering AI or joyful AI or any of these things, essentially what we are um, grappling with, whether we admit it or not, is the so-called hard problem. You know, like, how would we know if an AI is really suffering or how would you define it or how would you test for it or how would you create it or how would you make sure to not create it? Um, so I'm wondering, like, can someone who knows more than I do talk about how these two questions relate? And for instance, does the, do we have to solve the hard problem before we can make progress about 
arguing other than in any more than a flippant way about AI suffering, or is somehow studying the question of AI suffering going to help us make progress in this hard problem of conscious experience and qualia? And so I'm just curious about that because they seem related, but we don't seem to be mentioning it so far. Thank you, Creon. Um, yes, I mean, as I kept saying that these are very hard problems. And, um, but perhaps again, this is um, analogy with um, animal um, welfare science helps um, because they seem to have for, for a long time um, people, and, and there's obviously still people um, not believing that, that animals are suffering and have pain. And because it's also hard to, hard to prove and to, um, to and that's why um, animal welfare science has, has been only recently developed as a, as a um, discipline and came up with methods, um, including those um, observational methods to um, really um, provide um, indicators for suffering of animals. And, um, and probably it is much less challenging um, to prove this for, or to, to find evidence for animal suffering than for AI suffering out of given that we are at a very early stage. But um, we thought this is an, 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 a good way to, to start, to have a very um, uh, um, a foundation at least to start this, this, um, this topic. If we, comp if we come up with um, animal welfare science recently, uh, if we compare it or, 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 or follow up on the methods um, which have been developed for animal welfare science, those observational methods and try if there's any way um, at all to um, to adopt them or to transfer them to, to AIs or digital minds in, in general. Okay, I would like to, first of all, I thank you for that response. That's very interesting. I'd like to push back on it a little bit or maybe ask a clarifying question and then I'll stop because this could go on forever. But um, here's the thing. Um, uh, first of all, I'm not sure I, certainly it is true that the animal welfare and animal suffering question is related to the AI, AI suffering question. I mean, and the problem with the people who would deny the existence of animal suffering seems to me is that it's a very short step from there to deny the existence of suffering in any other human other than yourself, because your own suffering is the only one that you can truly verify, right? Especially if you believe simulation like hypotheses and things like that. It's like the only thing we can be truly certain of is that something is having, having an experience something like I am having an experience like that's all I know. But anyway, not um, even an I Creon, just not even, not even an I, right. It's not even, I think therefore I am. It's just, I think, right. Okay. So fair enough. But the thing is, is that um, I think that it's actually not, tr it seems to me perhaps not true that the, the animal suffering is sort of an easy route in. And here's why I mean that in a trivial sense, if we programmed up an AI and we said, you know, we're going to do the crazy experiment of trying to make it suffer. Right. And so what would we do naively? You know, one might write the software so that it prints out, Oh, I, I hate this. I'm suffering. Please stop. And then make it have a face that's grimacing and, you know, exercise options to try and force us or convince us to stop whatever it is we're doing. On the other hand, we could simply change the character strings and faces in that code to be a happy face saying, I love this. Please, please keep it up. Right. And we're obviously not changing anything with respect to the hard problem. Okay, so we're just changing like the external behaviorist outputs. Now, you can do that conceptually, possibly with an AI. You can't do that with an animal, right? You can't go into an animal and take all the things that make it suffer and reprogram the animal so that now it exhibits completely opposite behaviors as if it is loving the, uh, the torture, right? So. There's a difference here, I think, between the uh, artificially created and programmed systems and the naturally evolved systems, at least at this point in our, in our technology. I mean, you can give an animal or a human morphine and really change their suffering, on the, their suffering level, on another hand. Yes, a very brief answer only because I have to also further think this too, but, um, but you're talking about a small subset of those potentially digital sentient minds, which are those um, and like simple, simple AIs, which we still have the power to, to program like this, as you described. But, um, so, but we are looking at this very vast um, potential um, space of potentially sentient minds, which, um, which may be 
very yeah. complex and, and sure. different. I understand and I agree. Obviously, the idea of reprogramming the character strings is kind of a reductio ad absurdum. But I do want to mention that it does seem to me as an outsider that this question of what is suffering and in terms of like the hard problem of consciousness, what is it? That that is a profound question that relates to this issue of AI suffering and um, and uh, this idea that I'm not sure if it was you or someone else who proposed that the suffering is just a sort of a tool that the organism uses to try and alter behaviors or alter situations that are not, that are not good for it. Um, I think that 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 is also kind of blown apart, perhaps by um, by certain hard problem subjective issues like self-suffering and like the fact that morphine can totally change the experience of pain. Um, it, it seems to me that just calling it all a simulation and suffering is just another signal in the simulation that's trying to alter uh, behavior or change the external world misses a good part of suffering because uh, you can certainly have signals that alter your behavior that don't make you miserable. Yeah. That's all. I'll, okay, sure. thank I'll you. Mute. Um, you know, I, I was like when uh, Zunka, when you were mentioning, um, you know, uh, the, I guess the, the relationship between animal suffering and uh, and AI suffering, and that uh, potentially AI suffering may be something that we can wrap our head head around earlier or or, or, or easier. Um, you know, I was reminded of the fact that well, with animals at least we share a physical environment. We share like you know somewhat of an evolutionary history, and we share somewhat of the same hardware, uh, which is not the case for AIs. And I think, you know, like um, having read like Hansen, like, you know, uh, Age of M or anything like that, the types of experience, you know, that you can, uh, that, that other minds could be having um, just by the virtue of the, the fact that they can run much faster or, and so on, you know, leading to like him proposing interesting thought experiments about like imprisoning AIs and for how long and what would, what would, what would it mean to punish them and stuff. So. Like I, I guess I, I'm, I'm more skeptical. I think that we can do it for AIs than, uh, than for animals. But I think, you know, c coming back to your question, Kriyan, like I think that all of those problems about heart problem and uh, of consciousness, yes or no, and you know, like, uh, uh, like all of those are, I think, philosophically, really interesting problems. But I think if we come back to the topic of today's discussion, which is AI and superintelligent coordination strategy, um, those are problems that you know we may or may not solve before it's too late. And given the fact that we have to coordinate on something, um, you know, before uh, before it's too late, I think um, trying to come back and, and disentangling uh, questions uh, that philosophers, you know, have have discussed for so long. And I'm like, I love philosophy myself, but I think trying to put those questions between us and safety is like, uh, you know, a really um, um, a really dangerous, uh, or, or at least like risky um, proposition, at least, you know. So I think that's why, at least, I guess the Chris move of like, okay, let's put, um, you know, like a smart contract frame, framework in place in which at least for now only voluntary interactions are possible and whether or not we're going to tackle those uh, problems about um, uh, about the internal states of other minds later, uh, whether or not we solve that later, that's a nice cherry on top, but <laughs> for now let's aim low. <laughs> um, um, I think uh, Paul also had a question. Paul, I'm going to unmute you uh, now. Uh, thank you. So, everybody hear me all right? Um, if so, I, first of all, I want to thank you. Unfortunately, this does not have the option for me to shake hands or hug all of you right now. Uh, that is something that we really could use. I love you guys. This is an amazing discussion. Uh, Dakai, uh, going over some of these uh, uh, questions on, on how to bring like Buddhist philosophy into AI. Uh, I just love this. I mean, I did some early work at SIGGRAPH with... Uh, 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 digital life, seeding digital life with a bunch of SGI computers networked together. Uh, and people really loved the idea of uh, seeding uh, the virtual world with digital life that they created. Now, as a preface for my primary question, uh, all the data points in our lives, a um, hundred years from now, I propose that I'll have a digital assistant that's based on quantum computing and all of the experiences that I have will be data points. Uh, it's been told that uh, 
insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, looking for a different response. So if I have all these data points that I accumulate from our trials and tribulations, I'll have a digital assistant that will help guide me. Uh, so, and if it's using some like Tempest uh, security like the NSA uses, this is something that will be unhackable by other bad actors. So my question here again is forward looking, what effect could quantum computing have on hacking by bad actors for super intelligence, AI, welfare, security? I, I, I know that this discussion was just um, touched briefly. Thank you. I mean, I'll give a, just a quick answer. Um, by way of example, so I had to review a paper, uh, and uh, you know, they, I can't remember what the animal animal uh, welfare convention was. Maybe Sunka knows, but you know, the the authors had to attest that they abided by that convention for the welfare of the their laboratory rats that they experimented on. Um, Forty one degrees centigrade is you know the temperature at which uh, the skin. Uh, starts to burn and uh, you 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 feel you know uncomfortable pain. That's signaled by a certain signaling uh, frequency, a certain firing frequency of WDR um, project pain projection cells in lamina five of the dorsal horn. So I don't know. In some ways like that, I think the machines can uh, you know AI can uh, compile a set of uh, heuristical if need be. Where they don't need to know the inner workings, they just know they, you know, hey, we're not allowed to exceed 41 degrees centigrade when we experiment on these humans. And those would be encoded, in my view, in a distributed ledger, uh, so that it would be minimally hack hackable. Thank you. Okay. Well, um, you know, I think without having an answer to this, obviously, but you know, like I think. Building smart, like building smarter intelligences, may be our best bet at solving those problems. <laughs> um, you know that those uh, much smarter intelligences will encounter on the way. So you know, it, 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 in some sense, it's kind of like an offense-defense game. Uh, you know, even even with those technologies, but like by by at least coming up with a framework in which we can um, kind of like cooperate with artificial minds to be able to tackling those problems better, um, I think is the first step at least. <laughs> Um, okay, great. We have the last question here uh, from James, and then we are going to close it out, and you can uh, move into a breakout room afterwards if you want to. James, I'll meet you. Thank you. So I wanted to ask if anyone else feels as though we might all benefit from disaggregating some of the terminologies that we're using. For instance, when we talk about pain, yes, there are certain kinds where it's physical pain that is a kind of a, a virtual uh, interface that we use in order to avoid some sort of physiological or anatomical damage. That's a certain kind of pain, and we've talked about that kind of pain. We've also mentioned other kinds of pain, such as you know frustration. And I think that the question of whether or not AI is feel frustration is kind of an interesting question. For instance, like in computer science, exhaustive search or uh, NP complete or NP hard problems. I think exhaustive search is a great example of something that's frustrating. If you are searching and coming to terms with the complexity of a given system, it's not necessarily immediately in the short term goal oriented. You don't necessarily know what you're doing and you're playing around in you, the, um, the, the computational complexity that is uh, available or that the complexity demands that are uh, forced upon you. And necessarily um, fun. So, you know, from the, like what the Kai was saying from the Buddhist tradition and even what, what, uh, what, what Joshua was saying about the, uh, the potential to view pain as something else, that's one approach. People have also spent their entire lives mulling over uh, their suffering and their complexity and people have produced very interesting writings and a lot of what some people define as the human condition has kind of emerged from the ability of humankind to realize just how complex it is in a way that's not uh, necessarily goal oriented in a way that doesn't necessarily even have kind of clear preferences. And I imagine that if uh, super intelligence is even more complex then unless we're supposing that P equals NP and that it doesn't have to ask 
questions, doesn't have to search, that it can generate the answers immediately. And I think that a super intelligent, especially if it's trying to grapple with very, very difficult questions, that it will suffer. And I think that that's kind of the whole point, that, uh, that that's something that we should kind of prepare for. Prepare for, And I, I don't see why uh, we would want a super intelligent organism not to, to suffer in that kind of way. What do you guys think? Yes, um, thank you very much. Um, again, um, I, I didn't have that much time um, to, that um, in, in our paper, we, we highlighted various um, um, places that indeed um, there are different types of suffering, not only like physical pain, there's, fr as you say, frustration, disappointment, things that don't happen. So um, this is more complex, we, we agree and, um, and, and uh, I, I agree with you and we kind of mentioned it in, in the paper that this is complex and also the other point that um, um, that other other digital minds, other minds may have um, qualia we cannot even think of, we have no imagination of their unknown unknowns. Um, we try at, at several um, places in our paper to, to um, highlight that there are so many unknown unknowns and um, including um, Qualia, obviously not imaginable for us that other beings could have, um, and that this obviously cannot be addressed um, and could not be addressed in, in this paper. Chris, do you want to fill anything in? Uh, no, I have nothing to add. All right, I just shared uh, Zunz's paper again, and Chris, I'm going to share yours too, in case people now feel inspired to read up your chapters. Uh, would any one of you um, kind of close it out with a few final words of like, what kind of research would you like to see coming out of this? Um, we the authors? Yeah, Chris or Zunz, oh. you know, like, I think whenever you're writing something afterwards, you're like, oh man, now I have more questions than answers, you know? Yeah. So uh, what are kind of like things that you'd like to point people's attention to? Well, the, 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 the folks that pointed out, you know, uh, can we really create an unhackable system uh, motivate me to, to keep going into, I, and I wonder if they would agree with this, uh, to keep going into game theory and mechanism design. And if, uh, you know, by designing that kind of a framework that in, in sense cooperation and uh, the right kind of competition if uh, that is a better, more robust solution than, um, you know, distributed ledger technology per se, creating an unhackable system. Yes, and um, no, thank you very much. I think all these, um, all the comments were really inspiring and, and, and useful and I took lots of notes and I'm, I'm, I will have, I will, I'm definitely save the chat for later. Um, but particularly, actually, the last point, we were looking at it um, already before, um, because we, we heard this um, comments before that, um, that um, um, suffering and pain itself is, is or suffering is, is, can be very complex. And it, it's, it's definitely helpful, at least, to come up with, um, with the, uh, to look at taxonomies of, of at least human suffering and to specify types of suffering. And, and then again, we have no guarantee that didn't, it could not be completely different for other, other minds. But um, so the, this um, looking into different types of suffering, this would be certainly a, a, um, a logical next step um, um, we would like to do and um, take it from there. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, like I had immediately like a thought to what you said, Chris, about you know whether competition uh, is perhaps better than a, a distributed ledger technology uh, for kind of guarding against future risks. Um, like those are not mutually exclusive, right? You can have like an ecosystem in which the diff the types of distributed ledger technologies that bring about safer systems are the ones that ultimately rise to the top or something. You know, so I think there's like a larger ecosystem in which those games could be playing out but yeah okay thank you yeah okay thank you so so much for joining i had such a blast oh my god and i think people really really love the discussion i'm like we had yeah it was it was really really good uh, i really um 
I'm very grateful that you stayed on for so long. I hope it was worth worthwhile for, your, for all of you. Um, and yeah, there's a, a lot of different threads that, uh, that one could uh, uh, that one could or could probably not, even with more hours, <laughs> disentangle right now. So thank you so so much. I really appreciate it. Um, next week we're also very likely going to meet again on Thursday. Um, and um, I'll post a little bit more information on this uh, soon. But for now, um, you know, I think last time um, after we closed out the final session, people stayed on for almost two more hours uh, in a breakout room. So there's no need to do that now. Uh, but we will open up a breakout room with a few prompts in case you want to meet and continue the discussion and meet other participants here. Um, and for that, I would love to give it over to the amazing Lou, um, who I think is over here and can unmute herself. So goodbye from me, everyone. I hope to see you next week. Thank you, Allison.